I didn't even know what the West End was before I came to England. I didn't know what the future would hold for me. I got the guts and I did a, a concert on my own. Ian McKellen came to watch that concert. Mm -hmm. All right. He kept saying, oh my God, this girl, this girl, she should be playing Evita. She should be playing Evita. Oh, <laughs> fast forward, I did play Evita. Tell me about the life. Definitely not as glamorous as you might think. If you put like 20 people in mm. a show, all the drama happens. I go to an actress and I have this exchange with her and she just has a go at me. Why are you interrupting me? Blah, 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 blah. But I'm like looking around, looking for a director to see if he's going to cut this mm -hmm. shot. She was improvising. Musical theater is hard. It's, it is harder. I'm not going to lie. Actually, I feel like the newer people coming in, they don't care as much. Like, yeah. oh, I've got a little cough, so I'm off. But I'm from a generation <laughs> where show must go on. Mm -hmm. And like, I had tonsillitis and I was on stage. Oh, and yeah. I've had two panic attacks in the past month and I've never had panic attacks in my life. Really? I'm singing and I finish one of the songs straight to the other song and I'm like, and I start crying. I was like, okay, it's just crying. I've sang through cry, like, I'm okay. And I completely turned my back to the audience Yeah. because I was like, <laughs> like this, crying. And Tim was here and he was looking at me and I was like, <laughs> just like, don't worry. <laughs> and, then, and then it was my turn to sing. So I had to turn to the audience and like kind of, I remember thinking if this is what it's like, I don't, I don't really like it. Why are people mean to each other? Why are they bitching all the time? So now I go to Portugal a lot. I feel like I wish everybody would go to Portugal. It's just a beautiful place. It's beautiful. It, the, the weather is lovely. The lifestyle, my gosh, the lifestyle is completely different. I feel like I live more. I'm Andrea Rogozin and this is Beyond Real Talk podcast where I invite real entertainment industry professionals and ask them real questions. What are they actually doing? How are they doing it? Why are they doing it? And how can you start doing the same thing? And my today's guest is an actress, she's a singer, she's a composer, Madeleine Alberto. Hi, Andrew. Hi, how are you? <laughs> I'm good. I'm excited to talk to you today. Oh, I'm excited to see you. I haven't seen you, seen you since last year, I think. Yeah. Probably. It's yeah. been a long time. We met at Working Actors Studio. I think the very uh, first time when it came to the Working Actors Studio, class and the very first class we actually did the scene together from gentleman i think i think we did yeah, yeah. 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 i was just thinking it was uh umbrella rooms yeah yes i yeah. was very nervous and then we, i mean we did quite a few scenes like it was always very lovely to work with you and my favorite scene yeah was euphoria, euphoria and it was yes. with you yes yes <laughs> I know, I have it on my YouTube. Yeah, 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 <laughs> me too. It was great. Yeah. It's great working with you and it's great to be part of this. Let's start. You know what? Let's start from the very beginning because I've never been to Portugal. Uh huh. And I just want to hear about, like, first of all, tell me about Portugal. Tell me maybe about your childhood and what pushed you into this world of rejection. <laughs> well, yes, I know. Resilience and rejection. Um, yeah, so I was born in Portugal. Uh, my whole family's still there. I was an only child and all I did in my spare time, I spent a lot of time alone, was watch movies. Mm -hmm especially Batman. Mm. That was my go-to Batman and Batman Returns. So Michael Keaton <laughs> yeah. and Michelle Pfeiffer, Christopher Walken, they were like my, my childhood friends, my, mm. my um, imaginary friends. And so I, I know for sure since I was six, I wanted to be an actress. Yeah. But I was quite shy and yeah. I never told anyone or at least that I can remember. And I think I always felt that I couldn't do it. Mm. And since about the age of six, I was dancing. I was in a little dance school as a hobby. I never wanted to be a ballerina. All my friends wanted to be ballerinas. I was like, no, I want to be an actress. But I enjoyed being on stage. I enjoyed that. I don't know what it was. So something that kept me staying in this dance school. And what happened was, is that one year, there was a, a performing arts college from London who came over for a week to do like a little workshop. They brought like their old, older students. And um, after that week, without me even realizing it, they spoke to my parents and to my dance teacher and they said, we want her to come and study in London. Mm. And the school was a performing arts college. So it had a lot of dancing, singing and some acting. And I'd never sang before. I was enjoying singing, but I didn't grow up with, the, with a big musical background uh, or musical theater background. Um, and it was the acting that I wanted. So 
after a few months of them inviting me to come, I was like, oh, I don't want to go because I don't want to be dancing. I just want to mm-hmm. act. And I'd done a movie in Portugal when I was 16. So before I came over and it's what I wanted to do anyway. Fortunately, the principal of the college uh, insisted and she didn't want me to stay. Um, and she, she, she brought me over. So it's thanks to her that I'm here mm. and that I'm doing what I'm doing. My journey was very different from the one that I dreamed, but mm. I'm still doing it. I'm, yeah. I, you know, not many people can say they're working actors or working performers. And, um, and so I feel very, very grateful, especially to this lady who saw me there mm. in this little town village in Portugal and, mm. and brought me over. Portugal still now is, um, it, it's, oh my God, I could talk about Portugal for hours. It's beautiful. But what I was going to say is related to the arts, for example, most of my friends who are actors in Portugal, they do soap operas. Um, in terms of theater, the theater scene is still quite small. I don't think you can really live from it even now, although it's getting so much better. Mm. So the fact that I did come over was a huge, huge, um, you know, um, in increase of everything in my life in terms of training in terms of meeting people and getting the opportunities that i've had Mm -hmm. and when did you move so i was 17 i finished my a levels yeah um i did a levels in like uh, biology chemistry physics because in portugal only very specific places you can do acting when you're that young so usually you need to go after a levels you go to an yeah. acting school but there aren't that many to be honest mm. <laughs> there's about two that i can think of that were possibilities for me if i hadn't come to, to england um and so yeah i was very young my pa- i don't know how my parents did it i, I was <laughs> 17 and i just went bye to put yeah, me on a plane yeah. <laughs> good luck <laughs> no, i'm very lucky i feel like my parents just really trusted me mm-hmm. the fact that i was offered a scholarship and that i was invited to come was also i've uh, well, one, financially, obviously, because if I didn't have the scholarship, I wouldn't have been able to come. Mm. But two, they felt like people would look after me in a way. Yeah. Um, but I was young. I was a young 17-year-old mm. and I had to fence by myself. And mm. I have all these years. Yeah. Um, I didn't know what I was getting into. I didn't know after I did my course what I would be doing. Um, mm. it, was, it was all just like, yeah. I'm, I'm gone. <laughs> Honestly, it sounds terrifying. Like when you're 17 to go like this somewhere. Did, did you did you speak proper English back then? Like uh, what, what, how like in Portugal, do people speak English or? Yeah. Well, I don't know if I spoke how I speak now, yeah. but I think I've always spoke pretty good English because yeah. I was I was also doing a degree, so I mm. had to do like. Um, like uh, written essays and things like that, so I'm pretty sure my English was good. Um, but in Portugal, most people speak re- speak really good English. Mm-hmm. Um, one of the reasons is is because most countries in Europe they dub everything. So if you go to Spain or Italy or France mm-hmm. and you see movies, they're dubbed. In Portugal, we've never done that. So I grew up listening to to English, mostly American stuff, some some yeah. British things, but. That's why I've got this weird accent and sometimes it goes really bad. I'm tired today, so my my speaking might be weird. But um, but yeah, I grew up listening to it. And also I was such a geek. Like I remember sometimes I used to record movies on audio cassettes. And uh, when I was doing homework and stuff, I would have like the audio cassettes playing. Interesting. So I've always felt like um, speaking English was very natural to me. Yeah. So when I came over, I, I didn't have. I didn't feel like I had a problem, and then obviously I've been here a long time. <laughs> <laughs> no, I yeah, no, I know what you mean because I think that's how I like learned English to a degree because uh, back in Latvia, like because the society mostly kind of like it's Latvian speaking and Russian speaking people, mm-hmm. so they also never dubbed any films like in cinema. In cinema, you just had subtitles for yeah. like Russian and Latvian, uh, and at some point. When I was watching, like the, the, the you know movies in cinema, like I noticed that the translation is wrong, and that's why I realized, like actually, I do understand English a little bit. But when I moved to UK, I thought, like, I'm watching, I'm watching Doctor House in English. I know English. I came here, and then suddenly I realized, oh, it's different English. 
<laughs> because yes. American and British, especially, you know, like uh, North British, like it's so hard for me. Uh, my English was way worse than I thought <laughs> yeah. 10 years ago. And then also I couldn't understand. I remember like I was looking for a job. Uh, I was working in the Russian visa application center and I was looking for a job as a designer. And I asked the guy, uh, my, my colleague who been here for longer like can you please just listen to this message on my phone and record like the, the number because i don't understand what they're saying yeah <laughs> but then yeah i kind of got used to it so okay what did you do after that when you finished your course like so you cure <clears throat> you're young uh talented you finish your course and what did you do like did you live all this time here or you kind of moved yeah back? no i've lived all this time here so mm -hmm. My course was very intense, three years, yeah. um, a lot of dancing, which I didn't enjoy. Like I would wake up at eight in the morning to go and do ballet class. I was like, why am I doing this? I don't want to be a dancer. But it was the first time. I mean, I don't regret it at all. Mm -hmm. It was amazing. But um, for the first time I had singing lessons. I'd never had singing lessons. Mm -hmm. And I realized that that could be actually my strength. We didn't do that much acting in this course, which is what my focus was even back then. Um, so what I did when the course finished, one was I stopped having singing lessons because I didn't want my voice to sound like everybody else's. Mm -hmm. So I started writing songs. I picked up the guitar and I was, wanted to find my sound. And like I'd go to bars in Camden and play like these really mm -hmm. like nineties, like <laughs> if this wasn't, in, was it? No, this wasn't in the nineties, but kind of like, I was like, when was I born? No, 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 no. Way later. Way later. No, no. But you know, the feeling of, cause I used to listen to a lot of, um, um, like, I don't know, Jeff Buckley and a lot of like things that were like quite, um, Melancholic, which we will talk about it in a minute about okay. melancholy if we want to talk about Portugal. But um, yeah, so so one aspect of the things was that was I felt like I had a lot of training and I was like, I want to be my own person. I want to have my own voice. So in terms of singing, I stopped. And then in terms of acting, I felt like I didn't have enough of what I wanted. So I started attending lots of courses and going to the Actor Center, which doesn't really exist now anymore, um, and getting my acting fixed through that. And then I was very lucky because a few months after I graduated, I got my first job. Um, so because I did a lot of dancing and singing, a bit of acting, uh, the natural course of the ways to go into musicals and do musicals. I didn't even know what the West End was before I came to England. I didn't know what the future would hold for me, but it just happened that, you know, I got an agent. Um, I started auditioning and I auditioned for the show, which I didn't get at first because it was like a big cattle call like in the beginning I remember this so well especially you as a dancer when you went to the auditions oh my god it was hundreds of people you'd have to queue up you have a number and I was like oh my god this is awful so I did quite a few of those in the beginning and this particular one the only reason why I wanted to do it was because Ian McKellen was in it mm. and it was a pantomime I didn't know what a pantomime was and but it was at the old Vic, so it was a very like high posh pantomime. And I went to this big cattle call, I didn't get it. And I think a few weeks later, I got a call from my agent saying they want to see you for this. I was like, for the same thing, I was like, great. And I got the job, and I was so thrilled because you know, Portuguese girl growing up with movies to mm. think that they're going to be in the same room as Gandalf was like the best thing ever in the world. <laughs> um, and it was, and it was a very, um. Very good introduction to the business, I think, um, especially to how people relate mm -hmm. backstage and um, like watching loads like the leads. So I had Ian McKellen, Marjorie Allen, you know, um, Maureen Lipman, watching them work. Uh, I had no interest to, you know, to, to be in the gossip side of things. My only interest was to really watch and see how yeah. things happen. Professional happened. side, yeah. Yeah. And it, I have to say, it wasn't a very happy job, that first job, just because everybody was so unhappy. The people, so I was in the ensemble, I was one of the dancers. And so what, what, sir, what was the gig? Pantomime of Aladdin <laughs> yeah. at the Old Vic. Um, and, and you, yeah, what, what, what you were doing? I was ensemble, I was one of the dancer singers. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, I did that two years. So one Christmas and then the second Christmas. The second Christmas was better, but the first Christmas was a very unhappy company for yeah. some reason. And I remember thinking, if this is what it's like, I don't, I don't really like yeah. it. Why are people mean to each other? Why are they bitching all the time? Um, 
anyway, the second year was better. And I even like, I got the guts and I did a, a concert on my own, like at the pit bar. I don't know if it's still called that. Um, downstairs uh, concert, at the your song? Um, um, actually at the time was probably, no, it was probably like jazzy stuff, musical theater stuff. And um, Ian McKellen came to watch that concert. Mm -hmm. All right. And, um, and he kept saying, oh my God, this girl, this girl, she should be playing Evita. She should be playing Evita. Oh. <laughs> and this was, I was so young. And then fast forward, I know we're going to talk about this, but fast forward, I did play Evita. Mm -hmm. And I got to tell him that. I got to tell him another job I did afterwards. I saw him there and I was like, you won't remember me. And he totally didn't, obviously. Mm -hmm. um, but I did this job with you and you said I should be playing this role. And I just played it at, in the West End. So he was very sweet and he gave me a big cuddle and that mm -hmm. was that. He, yeah. he seems like a, like a very, very nice guy. He's lovely. Yeah. I mean, the thing is, I... I'm still amazed that he's still doing it. Mm -hmm. You know, he is a true legend. He yeah. truly loves what he does. You know, you wouldn't think he would want to do pantomime, but it was his idea. It was one of his dreams was to play a dame and, and mm -hmm. he made it happen. I think it was mostly because of him that we were all doing it. Um, so yeah, I, I think having a first job and being surrounded by people like him and from his caliber was one, I felt very grateful, and two, I did learn a lot. How, how did you um, rehearse before you started uh, performing there? I don't remember. Usually it's between, if you're lucky, between four to five weeks. I think I did a, a play once where I rehearsed for six weeks. Mm. Musicals should have longer, but I've done musicals in two, three weeks. Yeah. <laughs> um, but then there's a lot more there because there's dancing and there's a lot of harmonies or whatever when you're singing and things like that. Mm -hmm. But yeah, but after Aladdin, that was my first. I, you know, it hasn't been easy. I'm not going to say it's been easy. I've worked a lot, but I've also had a lot of many months not working. Yeah. And I think especially in the beginning, I had the odd jobs here and there to keep me going. Like uh, I was temping, selling perfume. I think a lot of people were doing that. Yeah. I don't know if it still exists, that this company. Was it like in France, George Rubiani? No, it was like, it was like oh, a brand. temping company. And they would send you to like Selfridges and to Harvey Nichols. I worked, Liberty I worked. I was never accepted at Harrods. No. I don't think I was attractive enough for Harrods. Oh, No, no, it. it's true. It's true. You have to go on an interview and they're like, I think I used to dye my hair and they were like, oh, you've got roots showing or something really yeah. weird. Like they were, I mean, I shouldn't say this, but they were awful. And uh, <laughs> nobody liked working there. And yeah, I didn't do much of that. It was, it was soul destroying and I hated it, but I had to. And then I was actually in Harvey Nichols one day working for Clarence because <laughs> you work for different companies all the time. And, uh, I got a call from my agent saying that I had the lead in the musical mm -hmm. and I had to go back. This was like my 10 minute, like sort of break. And I had to go back until like six o'clock holding a perfume. We're like, oh my God, oh my God, I'm doing this. And it was fame. It was a tour of fame and I was playing Carmen and mm -hmm. it was a very dance, dancey show. Um, but it was my first um, sort of big role. And um, how yeah. old were you? I was probably 21 or 22. Nice. nice. Yeah. How long was the tour? Maybe 21. The tour was maybe, I was going to say a year, but I'm sure it was less than a year. Was it the just UK or? UK tour, yeah. yeah. Tell me about the tour life. Definitely not as glamorous as you might think, <laughs> especially in the UK. Yeah. Um, I'm not dissing. Um, producers in the UK at all, but it is very different. When you do an international tour or when you go, or if you tour the US, they provide for transport, they provide for hotels or whatever places for you to stay. In the UK, they don't. Um, so you have to find your own accommodation. You have to find, you pay for your transport. So whether you're uh, driving or your trains, so it can be very stressful. Really? They yes. don't pay for, for, for travel? No, what they do is, let's say you've got your your weekly wage mm -hmm. and then you've got something called a subsist subsistence, and which is an added to the wage. And from that, you're meant to... Um, and then sometimes they pay an extra for travel. Mm -hmm. But let's say you booked your train later, it's more expensive than what they gave you then that's it. They're not going to give you any more. Um, so, and the subsistence 
it's for you to get a place to live, supposedly a place to live and to eat. Mm -hmm. um, but it's very small. And it's changed a lot. Like, Fame was my first tour. And I remember, like, there used to be something called a, a theater digs list where you'd go to each theater and they have a list of people who offered to um, for you to stay in their homes, mm. right? Or there'd be apartments, but they'd be expensive. So I remember in the beginning, I would pay like 70 pounds a week and I would stay like in some lady's home. Mm. Um, and most of the time it was pretty bad, pretty awful. Um, but you're young and you don't care. And then sometimes you'd find a place where you can share with some, with some castmates or something. Now things are very different because now... Also because of COVID, I haven't toured since COVID really, but um, but I hear it's different. But even even before COVID, because of Airbnb, because of people feeling a bit more unsafe. Now since COVID, rules have changed. Um, I don't think there are that many. I don't even know if theaters digs list exists anymore. Mm -hmm. If people want people in their homes, and also there's a lot of Airbnb stuff. And one thing is, is everything is much more expensive, and two. People cancel on you. So like you could be traveling on your way to the next city and mm -hmm. they cancel. You don't have anywhere to stay. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm not telling people it's not fun to tour. It's a lot of fun to tour, especially for young. But, you know, you will encounter these um, these challenges sometimes. Um, I've just finished a tour of a month, but it was different. They provided hotels mm -hmm. and uh, it was one week in a different city. So I didn't have to sort out dates, but... Yeah, but other than that, I think for a young person, touring life is great. Yeah, um, I've done a lot. I've done at least four tours. I did Fame. I did Limes. I did Evita a lot. And I did On Your Feet. I think these were the four UK tours I did. Mm -hmm. um, and um, so I kind of know I've, I've seen the whole country <laughs> pretty yeah. much. And do, do you have enough time like when you're on tour? Like how often do you... Uh, move from city to city? It depends. Most tours are weeklies. Mm -hmm. So every week you would move. So your day off you're traveling. Mm -hmm. If you're lucky, you can be like two weeks in a place. When I did Les Mis, um, I think I was a month, at least a month in each place, mm -hmm. which was nice uh, because you get to not travel and then you have a proper day off. But I think most of them at the moment are, are one week in each place. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's tough. It's a lot. But um, but you can have a lot of fun and and it's a really great way to to work. I mean, there isn't that much out there in terms of work and and the West End is not is not you know it's not the 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 final destination. I think people in the West End get really bored because they are in one place for a year. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? So yeah. I think there's there's um, good things and bad things for both both uh, worlds. I guess. Yeah, yeah. No, it sounds, I mean, like, especially when you're young, it sounds uh, interesting. Tour yeah. life, you know, you're like with your colleagues and you move all the time and you perform all the time, which is a dream. But I can imagine it might be also very tiring. Yeah, I mean, for me, when I've done it, I was very, I was so committed. Um, and I enjoyed it very much. I feel like now I'm in a different stage in my life. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying I'll never tour again. Of course, I probably will. Hopefully not for a long period of time. Who knows? But um, but I don't feel that availability that I did when I was in my 20s. Mm -hmm. Just to give you an example, um, when I was touring with Evita, it was so tiring that I wouldn't speak all day. I would see no one all day. I could barely call my parents because my voice was so tired. Mm -hmm. And I, the only way of coping is to rest and be quiet most of the day, <laughs> grab some food, go to the theater and do a cracking show. Mm -hmm. And I didn't mind that. I didn't mind that I didn't have a social life. Now it's different. You know, now I see other priorities in life. I feel like I've done that. I've been um, doing, doing shows, especially shows where you have to sing, it's all consuming you go to bed thinking about your voice you wake up thinking about your voice um and it's i love it and i will keep doing it because it's what i do mm. but in terms of having a long contract and somewhere where you have to travel a lot is is very 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 demanding yeah i mean what what would be your advice for people who are starting touring like and doing the same thing like musical theater and stuff like you should probably have some kind of regime, right? Like how you a how routine. you take care of your voice, mm -hmm. how you take care of your health, how you're not not drinking too much every night. 
<laughs> yeah, but the thing is, people do it anyway. Yeah. You know, and I think, I honestly think my only advice is just enjoy it. Mm -hmm. And see how great it is that you have the job because yeah. most of the jobs I do, even with you know younger people, people who are just starting out, is that they get bored easily. There's drama straight away. There's the gossip. There's the bitching. There's the oh, I'm not feeling so good, so I'm not coming in. Or you know, just do the job. Like mm -hmm. thousands of people would die to have that job, yeah. and enjoy it. And if you need to have a little nightcap before you go to bed to enjoy it, then do it. I mean, I'm I don't drink. I'm not. A, I did drink previously, but never in the job, never on the job. But that's a personal choice. I'm not saying everybody has to do mm -hmm. it. I'm not saying people need to be nuns and monks and not not enjoy life if that's what they want. Um, but yeah, I just for me, it's just like really see it for what it is. And I know like if you're in a year's contract and you've done five months and you're like, oh my god, this never ends. Mm -hmm. Just just do whatever you need to keep going. And, and well, what would you do like to keep going? So for example, like were you ever uh, at some point like doing some show for such a long time that you just like at some point like, I don't know how to keep it fresh. I don't know how to like it's, I don't enjoy it anymore because I was doing it for like a year. Yeah. And I can't, it's like every night, same thing, I'm tired. Yeah, well, I'm very lucky because I've never done a year contract. So all, I think the most I've done was about eight months mm -hmm. in a row. I was involved with Evita, for example, the longest. I did it for a year and a half at one time, then I did almost a year another time, but I had big breaks in that year and a half, so I never did it. Um, was I ever, I don't think I was ever bored of the shows. I did get, I did get feelings of, um, oh, maybe if I wasn't doing this show, I could be doing something else better. Mm -hmm. Like I would, I still get that. Mm -hmm of like, I should have kept myself available, or I can't wait till this is over so I'm available for something better. And this is awful. Mm. Like, just enjoy what you're doing right now. Um, I think with with age and getting older, I get that more because I feel like life is so short. Like, I can't be in a year contract. Yeah. I have to be doing, I have to be doing other stuff. But what other stuff? They might, it might never come. <laughs> That's the problem. That's <laughs> and, the problem. Um, and so, yeah, I had, but you know what I did? I used it. Mm. I used it on stage. Like, if there were days where I like, oh, I really wish I was doing something else, or oh, I wish I had an audition for something else soon because I'm about to finish, or like all my insecurities and all my wishes, I would use it on stage. Like if I had a scene that was, uh, I mean, the, the, the show I was doing just before lockdown was called On Your Feet, and it was about Gloria Estefan's life. I played Gloria Estefan's mom mm. and um, it's fine. She, she thought I was a great mom. And, um, but yeah, but there's a scene where, where, where Gloria just had a car accident and the mom has got a lot of guilt and a lot of stuff because she didn't treat her very well. And I just used it. So every time I felt frustrated or anything, I use it on stage and you know what? I'd come off stage feeling, ah, oh, at least mm. I did my job, like nice. feeling good. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so it's hard. It's like this, work it's not for everybody it really isn't because you've got the side i mentioned the rejection the continuous resilience that you need to have and then also once you do get the job mm -hmm. if you're doing a musical or a play that is long running you need the resilience to do that mm -hmm. you know and yeah. to deal with people every day the same people that you see and so there is a lot in the job it's not it's not just you know rocking up and saying a couple of lines mm -hmm. i think it's it's a whole lifestyle and it's um yeah and what i love about it is that it's different every time mm -hmm. in terms of routines i think routines are helpful like i know people who i worked with who would go to the gym every day and that would make them good um but on tour is hard sometimes yeah. to have a routine i can't imagine yeah it's, i mean sometimes it's <laughs> hard to go to the gym when you're not on tour. And to eat well is hard, you know, oh, because you don't yeah. have anywhere to cook or, or most of the time. So you just eat, end up eating like a sandwich here and like, you know what I mean? It's not, it's not. So yeah, so if you're conscious about it and if you try and make it as healthy as possible for yourself and mentally healthy, like surround yourself by people who will help you mentally. Mm -hmm. I had a really hard time at some point when I was touring with Evita, like really hard bullying was happening like a lot of pressure and i could see how 
which is not my case, obviously, but I could see how people who are very famous and have a lot of pressure, how they turn to alcohol and drugs and yeah. to doing things that we go like, why is it? It's a lot. And luckily I had a whole support system around me that prevented me to, from, from, you know, from going down a rabbit hole that I didn't want to go. So I think that is very important too. So enjoy as much as you can and be really grateful and yeah, surround yourself with good people that keep you mentally healthy. Nice. That's a good, good I'm, advice. I'm just thinking about it. Good yeah. <laughs> uh, and what, so what happens if, uh, for example, like you're on tour and some of the main actors sick like kind of like lost voice or like what happens do you have backup artists for for them yeah so there's understudies mm -hmm. so you always have understudies for the lead roles and you have swings we call it a swing for covering all the ensemble people yeah i mean it's a lot of pressure when you're a lead and you go off actually i feel like the newer people coming in they don't care as much like yeah. oh, i've got a little cough so i'm off but i'm from a generation <laughs> where show must go on yeah. and like i had tonsillitis and i was on stage oh, and yeah. I, you know i had a i don't know anything you can imagine that was happening to me bad i would still go on stage but there are times where you just can't mm -hmm. where you bedridden or whatever and you can't do it and, and it has happened to me when my family came to visit oh. you know my family flew from portugal and i was so sick and um they missed the show and then i i I was in touch with a producer and, and I was like, I really want to try and do the last show. I, I might be terrible, but I really want to do it for them. Mm -hmm. And he let me go on and I don't know if I was any good, but I was probably like loads of painkillers or whatever. But mm -hmm. um, but yeah, so it's a lot of pressure, but there's always people covering and it's nice when they go on. It's nice when, because I've done that. I've, you know, I've done the ensemble. I've been a swing. I've been an understudy. Mm -hmm. I've been an alternate. So an alternate is like an understudy, but it means you have, set dates where you go on like once a week or yeah. whatever and i've been a lead mm -hmm. so i've been through all of that which i think is really good because then once you're a lead when you're when you're the lead then you're more compassionate about the people you know who will cover you or who you know who needs kind of your support when they go on um so yeah nice. that's it it's like i can imagine like if there it's if, if it's a lot like a, a lot of young people who are doing the story like that Probably a lot of drama happening, yeah? Yeah. You know what? I, have, I was having a chat with friends yesterday and this was so obvious. Someone mentioned something, which is we are so used to sitting around for hours yeah. listening to people complain and blame and gossip and bitch. And we can just sit there and we're like, it's kind of entertainment. Yeah. You never sit around with people going like, oh my God, I had the best day and I'm so grateful for this and I can't wait. Like, and I feel like it's part of human nature. So uh, obviously, if you put like 20 people in yeah. a show, all the drama happens, you know, relationship drama, you know, people who are too sensitive, people who are not sensitive, mm. like all of it. And um, it's know, a lot maybe, of management. Maybe it's the next idea for a new reality show. Actual like theater company goes on tour, they do the tour, but they're also like back up, you know, <laughs> back up shooting the, the... The thing is, it is a great idea. The thing is, I think um, when people are aware there's cameras, they always act differently. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> but true. yeah, all the dramas. And sometimes you think it's only long running tours, but even mm -hmm. short running tours or short running shows. Oh yeah. my God, the drama. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> See, we're enjoying it because it's drama. <laughs> we yes. shouldn't be. <laughs> That's why reality shows are interesting because, know. We, you know, not to me, of course. <laughs> human, human nature is uh, really, uh, yeah, fascinating. Yeah. So most of, of your life, artistic life you were doing theater and musical theater yeah? yes yeah most of it yes um i did a couple of plays which was always like a big thing <gasps> i'm doing a play yeah what do you mean you're not singing no 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 no, no. no. just a play <laughs> 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 um which was great it was it, you know it was good but you always think if i'm doing a play mm -hmm. it means casting directors will come and then i'll mm -hmm. be doing television and then mm -hmm. i'll be doing this um it didn't happen like that it's been a very very long treacherous um um journey which is still mm -hmm. happening to try and move from musical theater to screen when i started everybody said it was impossible it doesn't happen yeah yeah like most of my career it, it, yeah, everybody's like, oh, nobody will ever see a musical theater performer. And I get why, 
I get it. There's so many actors in the world and you've got such a big pool of like actors who come from Rada and Central. Why would you go see people who train as dancers? Um, I understand a bit of the stigma, um, but it's a stigma that I grew up with, mm-hmm. you know, all, the, all this time as an artist, as an actor. And also that made me not believe that I could do it. Even though inside me, I'm still the six-year-old girl who wanted to be a Batman. Do you know what I mean? So, um, so it's been a long time. I feel that since all the new, you know, um, the new production houses and Netflix, the Amazons, the Apple TVs and all that, since they've emerged, I feel like there's been a, a bigger opening because there's a lot of work. Um, so they've opened the pool. So I know a couple of friends who used to do musicals who have happened to make the transition. So I'm like, man, it's just a luck game. It mm-hmm. is just a luck game. I, did, I mean, to a degree, I mean, like you still have to do the job. You still have to do the grind. Yeah, the but thing. if you're not in the room, so yeah. if you don't have an agent that can get you in the room, if you don't mm-hmm. have a casting director who's open to get you in the room, yeah. um, then all the hard work is also... Yeah, but that's like this part of hard work to get a good agent. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but you need to be lucky to get a good agent or oh, yeah. an agent. You might be with the best agent in the world, but because they're so good, they're not getting you in places because they're getting someone else there. I mean, I don't know. Yeah. Um, I consider myself very lucky. I, I was with an agent for 11 years and I loved him and I have a lot of love and respect for him. Um, and then I felt that it was the right time to move and I moved agents and I absolutely love my agent now. Mm-hmm. Um, I know they do everything they can to try and get me seen. And it's good because then you feel like, okay, at least you got someone who's fighting your corner. You're, you know, doing everything you can. You're doing, cla- you're doing class mm-hmm. all the time uh, to keep everything going. I'm lucky enough that I get work, you know, so I can develop myself when I do some work. Um, but I still feel like it's a luck game. And... And a numbers game, you know, and I feel that only since I moved to this new agency that I started paving my way to try and get into TV and film. Mm -hmm. Um, So the last, I don't know, five years, but then we've got COVID in the middle. So not long, not long. (laughs) Um, And yeah, and I'm during lockdown, I was very um, lucky because I was in Portugal. We can talk about this. Um, I was in Portugal for almost a year during lockdown Mm -hmm. and I've never worked there. And I was like, okay, I don't know if I will ever work again. So let me see what happens in Portugal. What what do we have here? I realized there's agents now in Portugal. What? Agents? Mm-hmm. <laughs> I realized there's more than one casting director. What? <laughs> um, so I started like, I tried to get an agent during lockdown. I sent a lot of emails. I tried to get meetings. It wasn't easy. And months and months and months later, um, I get a call from a production house I, saying, are you in Portugal? I was like, yeah. And they were like, um, okay, can you come over tomorrow to shoot something for a soap opera? But soap operas there are not long running. They're kind of like TV series. They're kind of short. Oh, really? It's, and, it's not uh, like in Brazil. No, no, no. <laughs> so then I was like, sure. And I'm like, yeah, because we have this actress. She's a very famous actress in Portugal. She's in her 60s. Mm-hmm. And she got COVID and... I don't think they wanted to wait for her. So they were like, would you just come and take her part? And I was like, great. And I thought it was a king. Wait, so she's in her 60s. How do you... I know. Don't get me started. This is the story of my life. (laughs) Stop it. (laughs) It's fine. It's fine. (laughs) <laughs> anyway, it's not fine. so um, it's not. um no, but but they were like and I thought it was a cameo role because the TV series was already running on television and she's a very famous actress, so and she wasn't in it already. <laughs> so basically she shot a few scenes and all I had to do was reshoot that and then shoot the rest. When I arrived, I realized that she had a massive role. She was in 50 episodes. Mm-hmm. I was like, oh my gosh, okay, I'm doing a soap now. And I'd never done soap. I mean, I'd been in this in a studio before and it said I'd done like a guest role in Holby City or whatever but it was it was big for me and I had the best time of my life I yeah. realized that every actor should go through soap experience yeah um you know because it's a big quick learning school of like you just all right basically my first scene I'll share was with a lot of people a lot of extras with a musician playing and all this and uh, so I was a little nervous. I was like, oh, this is cool. But a lot of movement as well. And like 
noise so I couldn't hear my my cues. I didn't know who was who, or who was going to say what. But at some point, I go to an actress and I have this exchange with her and she just has a go at me. Why are you interrupting me? Blah, 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 blah. Like on and on and on. And I literally, I don't know if this was the scene they chose, but I'm like looking around, looking for a director to see if he's going to cut this mm -hmm. shot. She was improvising. Yeah. I had no idea. I thought she was actually having a go at me. Mm hmm I never knew when my cues, what my cues were because people would just improvise the whole time. Oh, really? So most of the time, it's just me like, oh, uh, <laughs> like trying to come in. Anyway, it was great. No, I really but like, I, I want to I know more just about like soap life because uh, traditionally here, I know like if it's uh, like some big series or like it's, if it's a film, you do like maybe a couple pages a day. You know, feel but oh, like but in not in soap. soaps. In soaps, you do a lot. But that, that's that, that's the thing because I think in soap it's just like like yeah. this all the time. Like, can I, can I just can I tell you more about the like, soap life? Like, when do you get a script? Day before, on a day? Okay, so this is my Portuguese experience, mm -hmm. which is different, um, probably from what's here. But here you get it. Like, let's say you get a script every Friday, and you've got the weekend to look at it. Mm -hmm. So you've got the week ahead. And, um, but they could be shooting, like I met a lead who was shooting 20 scenes a day, right? So it does, it does make you feel like, okay, I understand why soaps sometimes are not very good mm -hmm. or a performance is not very good because you don't have time. Yeah. You don't know what you like. 20 scenes a day. <laughs> how is it, is it like how many Cruise the Heather because even like sometimes setting up the lights and, and cameras yeah. takes like half an hour even for this it sometimes takes like half an hour like for you to film 20 scenes a day it should be over like the same wow. basically I think that's why everything is done in a studio because in the same small space mm -hmm. you get lots of different usually it's some inside someone's house right yeah, <laughs> so yeah. you get lots of people's houses and they're just used to doing it. Like everything is so quick. Mm -hmm. You get like one take, realistically. Yeah. And then they might do a close up or something, and that's your take two. Mm. They don't care. I mean, I mean, I, mean, I shouldn't say this. <laughs> um, I had a great experience. I really did. But it's like their job is not to make you look good, it is not for you to be the best performer in the world. Their job is just to get it done. Yeah. So you need to do your homework. And you know, those actors have been doing soaps for like 20 years, so they're so used to it. And I feel that for them, they know the characters so well that they're comfortable with not knowing the lines that well. Because mm -hmm. they didn't have time to learn them. Mm -hmm. It's not because they were lazy. It's just that there's literally no time. Um, so that was my experience and I loved it. I wasn't, I wasn't shooting for a long time, but you know, especially in lockdown to feel that, oh my gosh, I got a job and I got a TV job. I then obviously had a very arrogant thought, which was, now that I've done this TV job, I'm going to get lots of TV jobs in Portugal. Hasn't happened. <laughs> um, and here, did it, I mean, maybe for here is good because people know, at least she knows how to be in a TV set. She's been in one. But I don't think it also was that big of a, wow, she's a TV actress, yeah. so we're going to employ her. Mm. Um, so yeah, so it's taken a long time until like last summer for me to get a, a, a job that I feel like I got a TV job in mm -hmm. the UK, um, which I just finished shooting. Uh, I won't tell what it is just yet because I don't want to get into trouble. Yeah. But um, but it was the best experience ever. Very different experience to the soap. Yeah. Um, even though I also felt like I, I was expecting to take much longer with certain things and and didn't but i also realized that maybe it wasn't necessary maybe why do you need to spend like two hours talking about something just do it mm -hmm. you know and if it's right for the director if it's right for the people who wrote it then why um but yeah and i, I was i was involved with it for four weeks uh shooting in Tenerife, which helps because oh, nice. <laughs> but the best thing about this job i have to say one of the best things was that because i was shooting away i got to meet lots of people mm -hmm. You know, lots of actors that I didn't work with because I don't have a very big role. So my role would, I don't know, interact with, let's say, five actors. I don't mm -hmm. know. And I got to meet all the other actors and I got to hang out with people. And I got to hang out with production people, with, you know, makeup designers and, and set designers. And that for me was one of the greatest things mm -hmm. was to 
um, not only do the job and get to play, but also um, to get to know people. If I was shooting this in London, I would have said, hi, good morning, shoot the scene, go home. I never really have any relationship with anyone. Mm -hmm. So that was one of the things that I was very, very grateful for, actually. Yeah, yeah, it sounds great, sounds great. I, I can't wait to see it. I, yeah. well, I mean, we can't name it now, and I don't even know. I, actually, I don't know. I don't know what it I'll is. Tell after. <laughs> You'll tell me after. Yes. But yeah, and you know what, we'll, we'll also do another podcast after that, but for now. Uh, so how different is behind the scenes, like, for example, West End uh, musical theater in comparison to just theater? Oh, the theater to musical theater. Yeah. Um, or it's kind of the same. I, I would say it's pretty similar. I think from what I notice, musical theater people are slightly different from straight actors. Uh, I don't know why. It's really funny. <laughs> I'm trying to think. Um, I think straight actors, I mean, I'm not dissing anyone. I've got a lot of friends, obviously, mm -hmm. um, who are just actors and people who are dancers as well. But straight actors in general look down a little bit on musical theater yeah. people. Although I've met so many even famous people in this job that I just did who are like, oh my God, you do everything. And they think it's quite interesting yeah. because it's hard enough to act. Imagine having to act and dance and sing and blah, blah, blah. Do you know what I mean? So I, I do think that um, there, there's been a lot of stigma, but um, musical theater is hard. It's, it is harder. I'm not going to lie. Um, and for me, for me, my passion for musical theater, because it's what I've been doing my whole career, because I fell into it. But my passion is the acting in musical theater. That is it. Mm -hmm. the musical theater is there also to tell the story. For me, it's not the best dancer or the best singer. It's, who, it's about telling the story the best possible way. So that is the challenge. How do you tell the story so well when you have to dance and when you have to sing? You yeah, know? I mean, the, the, that's the thing, because that's what I don't understand. Like, why would, would you be looking down on people who just can do more stuff than you? <laughs> well, I also think because a lot of the times the acting and the script is, not, is overlooked mm -hmm. in musicals. Because, yeah. you know, for you to have a musical, you need, you need to have really good dancers. You need to have... And you know what? I've met really good dancers who are great actors. Mm -hmm. But then maybe the script, the lines or the direction or... Mm -hmm what is required, what is asked of them, is not that great. Mm. You know, there's, I mean, there's a recent musical I went to see based on a movie. There's a lot of musicals based on movies. And the movie's great, it's a classic. I grew up with this movie and I was excited to see it. It's an opportunity to give a different life. But you arrive and it's like pantomime. Yeah. And I hear from the actors because that's the way they were requested to do. Mm -hmm. And, and so I do understand, I do understand the stigma. I think, I also think there's a big spectrum of musicals. You know, you've got musicals that are there just to entertain, that it doesn't matter. People go and sing along and dance along. Um, I've got musicals who are maybe take, take themselves a little bit too serious. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. uh, but you've got great musicals with great scripts that you can just, in a very truthful way, sing your way through it, you know, or dance your way through it. But in a truthful way, telling a story in a moving way. So I I feel like they're very different mediums in a way, but the basis is all the same. The basis is to tell the story and be, you know, as truthful as you can. And and it's not easy. Mm. It's not easy and even you know with 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 doing just a theater piece and doing it every day, eight shows a week. Mm. Eight shows a week you have to do this. So It's a feat. Mm -hmm. it, is, it is a feat, yeah. Mm. And now, like, thinking about it, do, like, do you have a preference in which media you would like to be or you just want to keep doing everything but more of everything? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm very much... I, I'd love to keep doing everything. Yeah. I'm at a stage where, you know, like I said previously, I'd rather not do a year contract Eight shows a week is a lot. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so if I do it, I'd like to do like a shorter version. Like I do a lot of those things now where um, I'll go and do a show in Slovenia or in China because there's there are shorter contracts. Or I'll work with composers and writers to, to create new shows and workshop new shows or try and work new shows. I enjoy that a lot. Um, it's the part that I enjoy the most, which is the creative part. 
you show it to people and then you're done. Um, and and it's, it's, it's short term. So that I would love to keep doing. And obviously I would love to keep working on television because it's, it's where I have the least experience. So it's where I want to keep learning. Yeah. I want to keep surrounding myself with really inspirational actors and people and crew people. And um, I felt, you know, when I was doing this job, even though it wasn't the first time I was in the set, I felt like a, a little girl, mm. excited. And um, so, of course, I'd want to do more of that. But I'm also realistic, you know, just because you do one job doesn't mean that you have floods of jobs coming in. Mm -hmm. um, so for me going forward is to keep doing what I've always been doing, you know, when I'm not working, go to class, mm. you know, try and keep myself healthy, especially here and, and uh, wait for other things to come. And, you know, because I'm a singer, I'm lucky that occasionally I've got things that come up. There's, I just did a tour where I was just singing um, and that helps me going financially as well. But the goal is to, you know, keep acting and, mm. and if it can be in screen, then even better. So you uh, did some theater after you had a lot of experience in musical theater, right? Mm -hmm. uh, was it like any adjustment for you, like as an as an actor, like well, because you have to act in music theater, and then you come yeah. to like some theater rehearsals or whatever? Um, what was it, is there a difference in like even any techniques of acting, or is it the same? For me, there wasn't. Yeah. For me, I approached it the same way. Um, I have to admit, after a few months, I missed the singing yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or the music or the soundscape. I don't know. I don't know what it was, but um, but no, for me, I approach it the same way. I, obviously, I think the biggest difference for me is between any theater work and television work, mm -hmm. um, even though the approach for me is still the same in terms of how I approach the characters or or, you know, how I want to tell the story but obviously when you get to camera there's a lot of more technicalities but this is why I think it's amazing to keep doing work and like doing class all the time um so that you know when I was shooting this tv series for example I tried not to be too concerned about it mm -hmm. um I was a little aware I knew where the camera was and I knew my marks and whatever but I I honestly felt I need to trust the work that I've been doing for many years and then if I'm too big or if I'm not very good, I, hopefully the director would tell me. So that was kind of how I approached it. Mm -hmm. But the biggest difference is there's no rehearsal. You know, I'm used to rehearsing for a month, you know, playing with the scene and uh, getting feedback from the other actor and say, oh, maybe we could try this. Maybe. And when you do television, I had amazing actors I worked with. I was so lucky. And we did run lines like there was no problem about running lines, but you don't have that that time discovery and time my favorite scene that i shot was actually um with a wonderful actor called stephen campbell moore and um i think the the reason why it became my favorite was because it was morning time the whole crew and everybody had more time it was just the two of us and because he's a very experienced actor he started asking questions mm -hmm. and that led to us having the time to play so how we first played it has nothing to do and how I thought my instinct was, oh, I, sh I should be like this. Mm -hmm. oh. um, and then by playing it and being directed and stuff and it being completely different, like mm -hmm. my character is such a bitch all the time, <laughs> <laughs> which I didn't want to because I want people to like me. Oh my God, <laughs> our egos. Um, yeah, so, so that was great. But I realized that it will depend on the project, how long you have. It will probably depend on people you're working with. But definitely, you have to do all your homework and be open when you arrive for everything yeah. to change when you arrive. Mm -hmm. So that's the biggest difference for me. It has to do with, with uh, the preparation. Uh, is it true that uh, when theater actors try to switch the screen, they're too big? Maybe. Well, was your experience enough? I think so, because Lee told me. <laughs> 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 no, actually, I think, okay, unfortunately, I think most of the time, yes, yeah. it shouldn't be. Mm -hmm. um, you, you know, when you're in theater, you are used to, you know, you're, you're aware that your audience is bigger. When you're in a camera, this is your audience. Yeah. So I, I do think there, this is your audience. I do think there is a shift there that I need to work on, that mm -hmm. I need to practice. 
But at the same time, I don't think I am and I don't want to be a theater actor that even on theater is all about this. Like, I remember, I'm always going back to this show, to Evita, because I did it for so long and I had so many, so many experiences, um, things that I learned from it. But there was a moment in the show, a very long 20 minute actually, where it was basically just Evita on stage and maybe her husband and stuff. But it's a, a, a very long period of time where she discovers she's going to die. Okay, and, and there's a song actually that was added for the movie um, where in this case, in this production, she's on the floor and she's like, you must love me because, and, and then also like, I can't, this can't be the end, whatever, whatever. Mm. And I remember people telling me, um, you know, you need to look up and everything needs to be this and that. I was like, I'm not feeling it like that. Mm -hmm. I'll just do it whatever happens in the mm -hmm. moment. If I'm looking down, if I'm crying, if I, I'm not going to worry. And I don't know if it worked or if it doesn't work, what I did. But I did have some feedback from people, like in this case at the Dominion Theater, which is a barn of a theater, it's humongous, and people who were high up, and they felt like they were drawn in. So they felt like they were part of it in the intimacy of the thing. It could have been just that one person's experience if someone else felt that they were completely left out. Mm. I don't know. But I still am a strong believer that you don't need to be over the top in theater. You just don't. People will come to you if, if it's truthful. And um, so that's what I meant by the bases should be the same. But obviously there's some technicalities and things that, you, you know, if you do eight shows a week, you're going to get things in you that are probably not required on camera, you know? Mm. Um, but also that feeling that because you're on camera, you can't move and you have to be mm. completely like not even move an eyebrow. Mm. I'm also not a hundred percent with that. I feel like everybody's natural and they've got their own quirks and things. And yeah, I don't know. I wonder if Meryl Streep thinks about her eyebrows or something when she's acting. I don't think she yeah, does. You know I, what I mean? I don't think it's about the eyebrows or anything. I think like it's if it's truthful, it's truthful. Yeah. Like the only the things that sometimes I remember when I was shooting my very first feature film that I was in, and I had a small role there. Like and we were shooting uh, outside, so it's like it's a night scene, and we like few 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 of us guys standing next to the like the this big like fire barrel basically no like just metal barrel where we have like a fire and everything and it's burning like we have a good conversation so basically if i move like an inch i'm out of focus yeah and basically i had to stand there like and we had to have, have this conversation and they added some wood into the fire like and during the take i just like stand there and i feel like <gasps> everything is burning like basically i'm too close because it also had like holes on the sides like this barrel like and just like all this he goes like, and I can't move. And I'm just waiting for the stake to end. And I jump out <laughs> because I couldn't move. And I would ruin the take, like if I would stay there. And I, I was taking uh, off my clothes when I, like we finished the filming and I had to change into my clothes. And like, it's just like skin is red. <laughs> oh it wasn't God. like, I, there was no burn, proper burn. But no, like, but it's dangerous. It, yeah. but it's like, I was like, wow. And that's what one of the technicalities I want to say. Like sometimes you have to like you just have to be here. Yeah. You can't move because otherwise you'll be out of the shot. You'll be blurry, like and all yeah. this stuff. Yeah. No, I I'm I'm also being a bit facetious. You have to have a lot of technical mm -hmm. skills. You know, if you're doing a close up, yeah. you have to be aware that it's a close up. Mm -hmm. Um, but for example, sound wise, I remember when I shot some things here in the UK. Um. I don't want to say what it was because I don't want to put anybody in um, in the spotlight. But it's TV series in the UK. I had a very small role, and um, and when I when we went to shoot, so so the actors would be like on their phones and talking to me normally, blah, 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 blah. and then they say action, and be like, <laughs> and literally I struggled to hear them, and they were right in front of me, and I was like, okay, well maybe this is how you do it, but I just I just said my lines normally. And I had a sound engineer coming up to me yeah. and whisper in my ear, thank you for speaking normally. And that's where I learned, like, you know, we, we see things and sometimes it's affectation, sometimes it isn't. If you have a close up and the mic is here, mm -hmm. I understand. They want you to be intimate. They want yeah. you to. So I think it depends on every circumstance. But if it's not, if it's a wider shot and you're having a normal conversation with someone, just 
talk normally. <laughs> like, mm. I don't know. I don't know. It's it. I'm learning. Like I'm not teaching anybody anything about screen acting at all, mm -hmm. or any acting to be to be honest. Um, so I'm still learning, and I'm I'm still seeing that it it will depend on the circumstance. It will depend, but I feel it. Sh the basis should be should be the same, and yeah. then when you get there. Do all your classes, do your preparation for the technicalities, and uh, mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, what would be your favorite role by by well, up until now that you did? My favorite role, well, um, in in theater, I have to say Evita mm -hmm. because it was the one that I was involved with the most, the longest. Um, it was it was a lot, and it's because it's probably one of the hardest, if not. Yeah, I'm gonna say one of the hardest female roles in musical theater, mm -hmm. and that is not done often. So it's not as if you know I played Fontaine, but Fontaine, hundreds of people have played it because it keeps going, going. While Evita, not as many people would have played Evita because it's not done very often. Um, so I would say I would say Evita, but I've I've done so many shows where I've loved, like especially I've done a lot of fringe work as well where you're in a very small theater, usually you don't get paid or paid very mm. little. This particular one, I didn't get paid. I did Jacqueline Hyde and I played the role of Lucy, um, who's like some sort of pro know, prostitute or whatever. And she dies because for a long time, all my characters were like downtrodden women, prostitutes who die, basically, you know, because I had the girl in fame. I had Jacqueline Hyde. I had Fontaine, I had Evita, I had Piaf. Piaf was in real life. She also prostituted herself and you know, she had a very tragic life. Anyway, so um, so so even those smaller roles, I loved them so much. So it's hard, it's hard to say, but Evita is like the top, the top role. And then obviously television, I don't have that many to compare, but in terms of his experience, obviously the one that I just did. Mm -hmm. yes. And hopefully there'll be more to yeah. come. <laughs> of course, of course we'll do. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and uh, you said you missed singing at some point when you were doing theater. Tell me about like your music and what it is for you. Yeah, it's funny because I'm not a person who sings all the time. Mm -hmm. Like if I'm not doing a singing job, I don't sing. It's very rare. And in my 20s, I used to write songs and pick up my guitar, which I need to do again because everybody wants me to write songs. So I'm going to try. <laughs> but um, I don't know if I have it in me anymore. But I'm just saying that when I was doing the play, um, sometimes doing a musical is more fun <laughs> because then there's a beautiful song coming. I also feel that I feel music helps me a lot with emotions. Yeah. I ex exercise, exercise the exorcist, um, a lot of emotion when I'm singing. So if, if a scene, if there's just a talking scene that is very dramatic, I love it, obviously, and I get it out like we did in uh, Euphoria. In our, yeah, yeah. In Euphoria. Yeah. But if you're singing and you have the music to back it up and you have this, this it's just different. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so if I do a play for a long time, sometimes I miss the music. Mm. Um, but but I, I love doing everything. Mm. I just love acting. And as I said, for me, even in musicals, I consider myself an actress yeah. more than anything else. But performing this, like, do you, <laughs> I, I was asking this question to a lot of my friends on the podcast as well. Um, do you think us as actors wanting to be seen? I mean, like we choose a profession mm -hmm. where we want to be seen. It's not like our, for us, we're not just creating something as other creators in arts, like writers we show or whatever, but we want to be seen when we perform. Do you think we have some, like some narcissism in us? Where is it coming from you? For, for you? <laughs> Narcissism. That's an interesting question. I, okay, for me, let me think about my experience. Mm -hmm. My experience, um, I want to be seen when I'm on stage. I want to be valued. But when I'm off stage, mm -hmm. I don't want to be seen. I, I don't mm. want people looking at me. Uh, if I'm on the tube, I'm very shy. Um, even socially, <laughs> I'm laughing because, yeah, I'd probably take it from my parents. I'm not socially awkward. I think I'm quite nice socially, but um, I'm, yeah, I need to choose. I choose my moments where I want attention when I don't. I'm definitely not an attention seeker mm -hmm. at all. Mm -hmm. um, but when I'm on stage, if I'm performing, I want you to look at me. Mm -hmm. Is this narcissism? <sighs> 
that's very hard for me to say because I don't consider myself at all narcissistic. Of course, I have moments of, of ego, of ego focused things, you know, like we were saying before, I played someone's mother. Oh my God, for quite a few months, my ego was so hurt. I was even younger than the girl playing my daughter. <laughs> I was like, what am I doing? This? But, um, but yeah, why do we want to be seen? I think, mm-hmm. I think as humans, we want to be seen and we want to be loved. That's just what it is. Yeah. We want to belong. Mm-hmm. And I think if we're lucky enough to do a job where we feel that we love and that we feel that can give us that, that we are loved mm-hmm. and that we belong, mm-hmm. uh, then maybe that's it. Because otherwise, what's the point of doing it? Yeah. I but I mean, I'm sure even crew members or even you know someone who's in the background who's not seen. Hopefully, they're proud of what they've done. Their work will be seen somehow. Mm. Um, Maybe they don't care so much about people saying, I loved it, but I think they would. I think if you went to a crew member and they said, oh my God, the or lighting designer, the lighting was amazing. I think, yes, I think, I think, well, I mean, I'm pretty sure we did, like, we definitely, most of us want some validation for what we do. Yes. And, but the, the thing is like with actors, it's kind of like what we do, even if you play a role, it's you're still showing a part of you. You can't show, like you can't be someone else when you yeah, play a role. Still it's you all doing coming the work. from so like we are seeking for validation for what we are, <laughs> who we are, like in, in a yeah. way. So that's like it's it's interesting because I mean I was always drawn like to something creative. Even my job was like when I was doing design. Like it's kind of creative job to a degree, not as creative as some people think, because you still like it's not art. You do something that we were asked to do, and in a way that it needs to be done. Yeah. <laughs> but like I, I like writing as well. Like it's kind of expressing. Like and I was I I think I always wanted some kind of validation, and as actor as well. Like obviously, like I want. It's not like I want you to love me, but I want you to appreciate the work I've done. <laughs> it was yeah, good. and I think. Maybe it's also, we do it because we love it. Why do we love it? We love it because we love telling the story. We're embodying mm-hmm. something. We're feeling something. But we're only telling a story if you have someone to listen to it. Yeah. Right? And nobody wants to tell a joke and nobody laughs. Mm-hmm. Do you know what I mean? So maybe we need that validation to make sure that we've, we've accomplished what we set out to do, which is to tell the story. Mm. And also, it's a vulnerable place to be Mm. you're you're putting yourself every night or every day you're shooting or whatever you're naked in front of people because you could fall on your face oh my god the older i get the more worried i am that my voice will fail me yeah even though i have more experience i've had two panic attacks in the past month and i've never had panic attacks in my life really so it is this thing of like you are making yourself so vulnerable. And in, in filming, you might not notice at the time, but when you think, oh my God, but millions of people will see this and this will be stuck there in the internet forever. So if I suck mm-hmm. or if I look weird or if I'm terrible, then it will be there forever. Like, who wants, why do we do this? Do you know what I, mean? I don't know. Who wants to put themselves through this? So mm. I think having some sort of validation is kind of like, oh no, we like it. Keep going. Keep making, mm. <laughs> keep putting yourself in these uh, awkward, vulnerable situations. It's, I don't yeah. know. It's a very good question. I don't know the answer. So uh, you you had two yeah. panic attacks recently. It was on on job because of the job or yes, so, yeah. so it was one when I was filming. Yeah. And one on stage when I was singing. Oh wow! And this has never happened. I have I had a mini mini panic attack on stage once in the beats in maybe 2014 or something, mm-hmm. but nothing like what I had now. And I think I don't know why I had them. One of them. So the one on set was just before I went on set. It was after they did my makeup and my hair and my costume, and I just felt so not me. Like I look at myself in the mirror and I went, "Oh my god." And I don't know if it was that, if it was the realization of, you know, I'm living the six-year-old girl's dream right now. Do I deserve it? Was Am it I like any good? Was it like an imposter syndrome? Pardon? Yeah, yeah, maybe. Like, 
Um, I'd also seen some, seen some pictures of me like on the screen and I didn't like it because who does, right? Like it was a big shock. I was like, oh my God, do I look like that? Oh my God, this is going to be imprinted like this forever. Uh, I think it was so many things. I was overwhelmed. Yeah. And, but I was in my trailer like 10 minutes from being driven to set. And I was like, how? And I had to call someone to help me because I was overheating. They had to bring some ice. I've never had that in my how, life. How you dealt with it? Okay, very honestly, I put some um, mantras, Buddhist mantras. I'm not a Buddhist, yeah, yeah. but um, but I I there's um, a, a lineage called Dzogchen uh, like, that I kind of follow, try and follow, and, and it helps me a lot with mm -hmm. um, meditation. I don't meditate all the time. It has to do with like meditate in short moments. So like when you catch yourself something happening, just try and stop describing it very briefly and and then repeat. Mm -hmm. You know. Um, so I think the mantras helped me um, and, and breathing. And also I could see clearly what was happening. I could see clearly, okay, this is because I'm insecure, but I've been doing this for 20 years. Why now? Like, um, it doesn't matter. This is, this is your dream. You're realizing a dream. Uh, the second one, I was on stage singing. I can't imagine. And um, being on stage singing and having a panic attack. It was pretty awful. I don't know what I sang, but I managed to keep singing somehow. I am, um, again, also related to insecurity. That day I had felt insecure about my voice, about not liking the sound of my voice, about, oh, can they hear what I'm hearing? And I've been doing this for 20 years. Do you know what I mean? Like there was, there's something, and I don't know if it comes with age, also, the fact that even though I'm more experienced, I feel more aware or more putting more pressure on myself. I don't know what it is. Anyway, I'm singing and I finish one of the songs straight to the other song and I'm like, and I start crying. I was like, okay, it's just crying. I've sang through cry. Like, yeah. I'm okay. <laughs> and then I had to turn my, so it was a trio. So it was me, then John would sing and then Shona would sing. So I finished my little bit. And I usually turn to face John and I completely turn my back to the audience yeah. because I was like, <laughs> like this crying. And Tim Rice is like legendary, brilliant lyricist who was on stage with, was here. And he was looking at me and I was like, <laughs> just like, don't worry. <laughs> and then, and then it was my turn to sing. So then I had to turn to the audience and like, kind of like, I don't know how I did it. I think with my breath. Yeah. Anyway. After that song, I had to walk off stage. I was on the floor. I couldn't breathe. Someone was there like trying to help me. Then I had to come back on stage and sing. And then I was very conscious because usually singers should sing from their belly. Mm -hmm. So breathing in from the belly. And what I had to do was like, I had to like hold all my breath up here and try and sing from here. Because if I relaxed, you could hear my, mm -hmm. <laughs> like that. Um, it was interesting. Look, all of this are interesting wow. experiences. Like yeah. they're very cool. So I sang that, I went off stage again. It was only the second time I went off stage that I managed to cool myself down, calm myself down, and then I came back and yeah, it's bizarre. Wow. I don't know why these things happen, but um, no matter you know how experienced or maybe even successful, like I imagine all the big, big successful actors that kind of could touch that more, no, yeah, yeah. more, I've heard... more onto them, like more expectation and more mm -hmm. demands. And I think we're quite lucky in a way sometimes that well, I consider myself very lucky because I'm, an, I'm a working actress most of the time, not all the time. Um, but I don't have that added constant pressure mm -hmm. um, that very famous people do. I honestly don't know how they do it. Have you ever, like, because I'm pretty sure that you were, like, if you were on stage for so long, for 20 years you were doing this and you've been in big shows, uh, were you ever in a position where you were, like, when you were in the show, and it had bad reviews from critics. Oh yeah. Yeah. How yeah. <laughs> how have you dealt with that? Um, let me try and think because one definitely because it's very recent. But that one, even though the reviews were terrible, they were quite nice to the cast. Mm -hmm. um, it, to be fair to this show that had terrible reviews, it was a brand new show and it needed a little bit more work. Mm -hmm. It wasn't really finished, so it wasn't fair that um, it was that. But. Um, I mean, I've, I've probably had reviews, bad reviews everywhere, but I don't, I, I tend not to read them. Like I ask someone else to read them and if they're good, they can show them to me mm -hmm. because why would I want to read a bad review? Like, it's just going to fuck me up. So, um, so most reviews I've read are good, but I remember, 
uh, one in Les Mis, actually, in in France, because I, I I we did Les Mis in Paris for six weeks, mm-hmm. and one review didn't particularly love me, um, and that was hard. And I don't, but I don't remember what they said. But one that really bothered me was I'd been playing Evita all over the country, great reviews, and that's why we ended up going to the West End, and all the reviews in the West End, or most of them towards me, were great. Mm-hmm. There was one person, and I think it was from from one of the papers that everybody reads daily, uh, said horrible things about me. Yeah. And I was so upset, like after hundreds of really good reviews, that yeah. one review, one, because I thought it wasn't fair, and two, because it was like, oh, but this is the paper everyone will read on their yeah. way to work, or on the way back to work. Um, it was easy. I had some few days where I felt really bad and horrible about it, but at the same time, hundreds of people thought the other way around. Mm-hmm. So we need to choose who we want to listen. It's the same thing with social media. Like, there's nothing wrong with you choosing the friends you want to have in your feed, with you deleting comments on your feed that because it's our world, it's our little universe, yeah. and I choose to be surrounded by people who like me. Why would I want to be surrounded by people who don't like me? Or who are negative, you know what I mean? So, yes, I read it, and I'm sure there's lots of people who don't like me, lots of people who are indifferent to me. Most of the world will be indifferent to who I am and what I do. No, I no but you so. know what I mean? We need, to, we need to see things in this way. Um, so, reviews are hard, they're really hard, and I've had bad reviews. And they hurt. And for a long time, I would feel insecure. But you know what I did? I used it. I'd go on stage and I'd be like, oh my God, maybe I'm not very good. And I'd do a great scene. Mm-hmm. Do you know what I mean? So mm-hmm. everything helps. For me, everything in acting helps. If also if people see say you're wonderful the whole time, your whole career, then you might not grow as much as you do mm-hmm. as when you have like little knockdowns. So yeah. um yeah. I, I, yeah, I think it's worse when you're not mentioned. <laughs> I've, I've done shows where I thought I had really, you know, a good input in the show and then they didn't even mention me. <laughs> Why? Like, oh man, yeah. I wasn't bad, but I wasn't great. <laughs> yeah, indif- I think indifference is worse. Uh, indifference might be worse, actually. Yeah, I don't see. know. What would be, like, uh, you think, as a performer, like, were there any cases when you, like, when you know, I really fucked up. All the time. I I forget lines a lot. I used to forget lines. And the worst thing is that I'm not very good at making stuff up. Like I know people who forget and then they just make something up. Mm-hmm. Which has happened to me a few times. But a lot of the times um, I just go silent. Mm-hmm. I just, I got nothing. And there was one time. I mean, I've probably played a beat like 300 times. Mm-hmm. And there's a duet in the show and I had nothing. Every time it was my time to sing, I was like, nope. Wow. And the cast was like trying to mouth me stuff. And I was like, nah, <laughs> I ain't got it. So the music would play and then the guy would sing. And then and then it'd be my turn. I'd be like, nah, there's nothing. Wow. There's nothing. So it, it happens a lot. I've done so many mistakes on stage. Oh, my God. Um, most of them, hopefully, you can laugh about it like. And not take it too seriously. You know, it's live theater. It happens. And you're tired and your brain just goes. And it's fine. Mm -hmm. Not so funny is if my voice goes. Which, I have to be very honest, it hasn't happened that many times in, like, when I'm doing, actually doing shows. Maybe one or two concerts where I felt like I didn't have much control of my voice. And it's petrifying. Usually in shows, because you have rehearsed and because it's in your muscle memory... Um, Most of the times, like even if you're tired or if you're ill, you can get through it and you're still in control because it's in your muscles. Um, But yeah, and in terms of like career mistakes that I learned, um, I don't know. I look back and I see that there have been times where maybe there are missed opportunities Mm -hmm. um, and I love to blame it on other people, like blame it maybe on my agent at the time that maybe didn't didn't get me the meetings I should have gotten at the time or something like that. I've, I'm not a person that turns down a lot of jobs, but I have turned out jobs. I don't think I regret them turning why, them down. Why would you turn out turn down jobs? Well, if it's a pantomime, mm-hmm. if it's something I really don't want to do, even if the money is good, 
I just don't do it. Mm. But I've also turned down a couple of jobs that came back to me saying, but we really want you. And I'm like, oh, okay, if you really want me, I'll do it. <laughs> so, so, you know, I don't have much conviction. I think, I think instinct is really good, but a lot of the times my instinct is wrong. Like, I'm like, oh, I really don't want to do this because my instinct tells me not to. And then I do it. I was like, actually, it was really lovely. Why, well, why would it be like the case when your instinct tells you not to do it? Is it, is it fear? Is it just like not, it doesn't excite you that the... Most of the times when I come, it's because I feel like something better might come mm. along. Which is not a good place mm -hmm. to be in because most of the times it doesn't. Mm. Um, so... I don't know, you know, some people believe that work is work. You know, you just need to be grateful to whatever comes up and you take it. And a lot of the times I do. Um, so I feel guilty when I don't, which I shouldn't because it's also, you know, we should choose what we want to do. I But mean, as actors, your... we don't have much agency because we're very dependent, unless if you're writing your own stuff or putting your own shows, we're so dependent on the people that when you have agency and you say no, It kind of feels like, oh, you're an ungrateful bitch. Mm. Like, you should be saying yes to everything. <laughs> um, but like I said, I don't think I regret the things I said no to. Um, maybe a couple of things I've done I shouldn't have done, like some, some indie films because I wanted the experience so much. Uh, things that maybe if I look back, maybe it doesn't look very good or I don't come across as very well. But in the long run, I feel like I've done the best I could in terms of like choices and maybe, maybe there was a path at some point where if I said no, or if I said yes, or if I had that meeting, maybe I would be there and not here, but who yeah, knows? I don't know. I don't know. Maybe you'd be there. Like it's just, yeah, you're, you're, you're in a good place. As you said, like there are thousands of people who dream to do what you do and yeah. you get, get a chance to do it more yeah. often than not. Uh, do you still get excited when you get a job? Yeah. Any job. I mean, any, any, I any think. job. Um, I don't know. Maybe some jobs, like the ones that are in the beginning, I'm a bit like, mm. Mm -hmm. like I took a job where there was a lot of dancing involved. I was like, oh, I don't want to dance. <laughs> uh, I can still dance, which is pretty cool. Um, but as I said, I only do it in the jobs if it's required. Yeah. Um, and it was a style of music that it didn't, I don't resonate with particularly. And this is one of the ones that I said no to. Mm -hmm. And then they came back and I was like, okay, maybe I'll do it. It's just like three months. Yeah. You know, so if the job is like, sure, if it was a long running thing, it would have been a no, 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 no. Mm -hmm. So, so sometimes I'll get as excited, but most of the times I do, I just, I love new adventures. I even love like now, for example, I just finished two jobs. I've got nothing coming up. I've got a couple of concerts. And it excites me because anything could happen. Mm -hmm. Also, nothing could happen, but also anything could happen. So, a couple of concerts where people can go and hear you singing. Oh, it depends. I, I very rarely, which I did one recently, so it might be a long time before I do it. I do solo concerts, like I did one in London at a venue called Piano Smithfield, where um, I'll play stuff from musicals and stuff from jazzy stuff and some of my own stuff, um, which I really enjoy, but it's a lot of work and a lot of pressure. Mm. <laughs> and then I do concerts like I'm hired to do. Um, for example, I'm going to be doing a very big concert in Portugal um, of We Will Rock You mm -hmm. in a big arena with like thousands of people in the audience. Nice. Um, I just did this tour with Tim Rice. Um, yeah, so if, if you want to know, maybe follow me on Instagram mm -hmm. or check my website, although I don't, um, I don't update my website as regularly as I should do. <laughs> just reminded me. Um, yeah, but like social media, it's great. I think for us as performers is good in a way because it's the only way to let people know what we're doing. And yeah, yeah. <clears throat> if you have a lot of followers, yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, how much is enough you know do you know what I mean like I realized in Portugal for example they care a lot about Instagram followers yeah. even to do acting jobs well especially to do acting yeah, jobs yeah, yeah. Yeah. um so it is sad because I'm not as I'm not a social media person like I post I mm -hmm. I but I'm I can't mm, I just think some people are good at it. Mm -hmm. Some people are good at it. They know what content people want to see, content, 
they put it out, they're regular. They, mm. the, the, I just, I'm not like that. If I have something to post, I'll post. If I don't, I don't. Like, yeah. So I don't see my number of followers grow. I think it grows when I do certain jobs. Mm -hmm. um, but also, how else will I get followers? I just want to do work. And if you mm. like it, they can follow me. You know what yeah. I mean? Yeah, I agree. Um, yeah. What would be your most happy moment and like while you were like in your performance performer life oh my god that's so hard is there anything that sticks out something that you really remember some moment on stage or like some show some role um well i remember a few i remember um when i played evita in glasgow it was one of my first venues and the reception was just the most incredible thing I've ever felt in my life yeah. um, in the end of the show. Um, my ego was very happy. Mm -hmm. No, but it wasn't just about the ego. It was it was what we were talking about. It was about, my gosh, we've worked so hard. We trained, we rehearsed, we've been down in the dumps, we've been broke. Mm -hmm. You know, it's. I think when those moments happen, it's not about the moment and about, oh, everybody loves me. It's not that at all. Also, because I'm very aware that most of the time it's not you. Anyone who had been playing that role on that day mm -hmm. would probably have the same reception. Like, do you know what I mean? I think when it comes to audiences, and this I've noticed it a lot, you know, some people can tell the difference between, you know, a performance that is, let's say, more truthful and a performance that's less truthful. No, not that I'm saying that someone else playing the role would be less truthful. I'm not saying that. But let's say we're talking about these two things. Some people will notice and you'll feel something and they'll feel something different, but they won't know what it is. Mm -hmm. A lot of people go and they just want to be entertained. So yeah. maybe it doesn't bother them or it doesn't make a big difference. Anyway, I'm deviating. Um, Celia, so yeah, at that moment, I will always remember. I will always remember when my dad came to see me playing Piaf, Edith Piaf, because um, I don't know. I feel like he lived in Paris and he knew her very well. And the fact that he enjoyed it and my... I love my dad. He loves me so much too. But um, he's not very good at expressing emotions. So like very rarely he'll say, you know, I loved it or well mm -hmm. done. And that day he was just like, oh, he was like, there was something about him that it changed. So I'll never forget that moment. Mm. Um, and then I don't know. And most days on set this, mm -hmm. these past month when I was working, oh. I felt that way. Nice. Because we do this because we love it. Because as children, we loved it. And sometimes I can't believe that I'm doing it. Mm -hmm. And of course, when we don't do it, when we don't see things coming our way, it's frustrating. Yeah. It's not that we want to be famous and we want, oh, well, it's not that. It's like, this is what we love doing. Yeah. And we see other people doing. And we know we can do it. So it's just a matter of opportunity, mm -hmm. of luck. And this job, this recent job, TV job, I don't even know how I got it. It was one tape out of like a few tapes that I did that summer. Mm -hmm. um, it doesn't mean that that tape was any better than the other tapes. And, you know, I had thought I had no, no shot at it because they wanted a Hispanic American person to play it, mm. you know? So I did my best, but I was like, well, that, that's it. You never know. And I think that's the thing. It's exciting because you don't know if it's coming, but it can also be heartbreaking and, and just take you to very dark places because you don't know if it's ever going to come. And no matter how much experience you have, I've been working with very experienced TV people who work all the time. They have the same worries. Yeah. You know? So, um, yeah, it's not easy being us in terms of being an actor, mm. but I can't imagine anything else. I can't imagine doing anything else. Mm. And I feel like if we can survive, if we can keep ourselves healthy and, and mentally healthy, um, then we just need to keep going. Yeah. What's your process of preparing for the role? It depends on the role. So I've played a few parts that were real people. Let's say Vita, Piaf, Gloria Estefan's mom. <laughs> um, so people who existed. And then the process, you know, there's a lot of looking into them, to their history, watching if there's any videos of them. I never, whenever I played people who exist, I never tried to imitate them. Um, it has to come from just understanding where they come from and then just telling the story. You know, the, the people who have to do the most research, I think, are the writers. Because if you're a good writer, then everything is written down for you, right? Um, 
So the rest is just to add layers and confidence that I can tell the story and I can portray the story. But Piaf was the hardest one because I didn't have much time to prepare at all. I had two weeks. <laughs> and um, and she, she's very recent and she's got a voice that is very distinct and all that. So And I didn't speak French and the songs were in French. So there was a lot happening. Um, but my goal was like, okay, I'm never going to look like her. But, you know, there's an essence to her. There's an essence, an energy, um, a vocal quality that maybe I can, you know, naturally, spontaneous do instead of trying to cover something. Um, but anything else, okay, like um, anything else, my main thing is script, 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 script. You know, see what's on the script um, about my character, what I say about myself, what other people say about myself. Like write everything down. Mm. So all the facts that are there. Um, because I'm a strong believer that it's not my job to add anything to it. Um, as an actor, I don't need to create lots of stuff around it. If everything is given to me in the paper, if things are not given, then, and if I need, if I feel like I need more, then I can be like, okay, so where does this person come from? And does that change the way I do this or this? And if it doesn't, it doesn't, you, you, I honestly think you don't need it. Mm. Um, yeah, so for me, it's script, it's getting all the information out there, it's learning the script as well as I can so that when I'm on set or when I'm rehearsing, I'm open to whatever whatever might be happening spontaneously. Mm. Um, yeah, and then dialogue with the director if, if, if they feel like I need to do something different. Um, that's it, like this, this TV thing I did, the woman is a DEA agent, so I looked into the DEA history just because I wanted to see, and this is in the 90s. So I was like, okay, being a woman in this, quite, it's a big deal. Mm -hmm. Like she had to fight in the man's world. So that was helpful. Do you know what yeah. I mean? Yeah. Come in and feel like this woman has balls. She's mm -hmm. here. Um, at the same time, she's just a normal woman. You know, I don't have to play a DEA yeah, agent. Yeah, yeah. Like. I'm just a normal woman who happens to be a DEA agent. And, and, um, and I did do a bit of research and I read about some women, especially in the 80s and the 90s, who, who started at the DEA. And, but just to give me some, you know, just a world to live in a little bit. Because when you get there, when you get on set, that, those things don't help you. Mm -hmm. They're just in the back of your head, all the research that you do. Um, yeah, I mean, because if you're actively thinking about it, you're not in the moment. Yeah. But like for you to be in the moment, for them to affect you, you, you have to have something in your head. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, you can have it. You can do as much research as you want. In this case, it was helpful. I did um, a new show where she was a scientist and I started reading like Stephen Hawking's uh, books mm -hmm. also because I was interested. I don't think it helped my character immensely, <laughs> but it, it helped me to when I say Stephen Hawking, yeah. like, yeah, he's amazing. I just read his book. Do you know what I mean? So yeah. I honestly, I honestly don't think there's a science to acting. Mm. I think every person is different. I think every circumstance is different. Every job is different. Um, things that might help you a lot in one job might not help you in another job. Like I, cause I'm, I'm very into Meisner work. Um, and I don't do enough as much as I wanted to do, but for me, Meisner is like the basis, is like the stretch mm -hmm. for an actor in terms of like, if my basis is Meisner, then I can add or I can experiment with all the other things because it's just about being present and reacting to the other person, right? And um, and there's there's something that Meisner talks about, which is um, preparation, like preparation for a scene can be physical, emotional, uh, a memory or whatever. And I had this scene, it was the day I had the panic attack, mm -hmm. right? I had a panic attack and I'd been so excited about shooting the scene that day. I had three scenes because one of them had been in my audition. So it'd been in my head for like months. And I was like, I, I got this. And I was excited to work with these two wonderful actresses. And my whole energy was like, because of this mm -hmm. panic attack. And I had a scene where I had to walk in and walk in with quite a lot of confidence and like, what the fuck happened? So I didn't even know if I could do this, but I didn't give a shit. So basically when everybody's setting up, like just as they stand, stand by before they say action, I did some press ups. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
And uh, I was like, I don't care. I don't care. People think that of me. And I was doing it so that my heart would be pumping yeah. because I knew my mind wasn't there as much as I wanted it to yeah. be. You know, I was worried about where's my makeup check. It's like, I don't want to go into a scene doing that, like mm-hmm. thinking that. So I did something physical mm-hmm. um, and I did the scene. I mean, they're probably terrible scenes. I don't know what the result is, but Stop it. no, no, they, you don't know. But, um, but at that precise moment, that was the preparation I needed mm-hmm. because I needed to get out of my head. Yeah. So I needed to do something physical. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and I actually think, I mean, I don't know, but I felt that the crew and the director were very respectful of that. Yeah. Because they saw it happen once, but then I, I did it a couple more times and I felt like everyone was quiet around. And, and um, so I enjoyed that. So that's the thing. It's like when we get to work, we get the experience of working, we get to try all these things that we've been training. Yeah. And also we get to experience it with different people. Like it's just, yeah, it was great. Nice. How often do you go back to Portugal? So Portugal time. Yes. <laughs> I've always gone to Portugal quite frequently, like mm-hmm. uh, every hall, like two, three times a year, I was thinking, mm-hmm. I say. But because of lockdown, I spent there almost a year. Mm-hmm. And since then, I felt it was harder to be in London, especially when not working. You know, I love London. We all love London. London is a tough city. Yeah. You know, expensive people, too many people, like... Strangely, um, sometimes so many people and you feel so alone. Yes. Yeah. Utter loneliness. I feel like I don't live as much. Like I try and do things with my day and I try and be as proactive as I can all the time. But I don't know. I just, I don't know. And so I was very lucky and I managed to get a place in Portugal uh, two years ago. Mm. And so I'm now spending a lot more time in Portugal. Like I spent three time, uh, three months over Christmas and two months last summer. Um, so I'm very, very privileged and I see that and grateful that I can, when I'm not working, I can be somewhere else. And now, especially because we can take for auditions and things, then mm-hmm. I don't feel like I'm missing out as much. So now I go to Portugal a lot. I feel like I wish everybody would go to Portugal. Honestly, I'm the biggest um, seller of, of Portugal. I should get commissioned from the tourism office or something. <laughs> um, and I, ha- I actually helped like some friends from Israel. They, 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 they found a place to live there now. And um, Portugal is still at the moment like the, the door to Europe. It's still relatively easy to get a visa. Not as easy as it was maybe a year ago because mm. everybody did it. Um, but it's just a beautiful place. It's beautiful. It the, the weather is lovely. The lifestyle, my gosh, the lifestyle is completely different. I feel like I live more. I get to do more. Like even in the winter, I do a lot of outdoor things. And What do you mean live more? Well, for me, in my experience... Um, Obviously my family is there. So when I'm there, I always have dinners or lunches. I go visit my grandma. I go visit my mom, mm-hmm. my dad. So I, I've got more of a social life. I've got friends there who um, work at the beach. So I spend most day at the beach. I go surfing or I've got friends, like the social life is different. Like we can go and meet up at 10 o'clock in the evening for a coffee. Mm-hmm. At 10 o'clock, I'm probably in bed or yeah. snuggled up watching a movie. Um, I feel like, and it's it, it it's probably says more about me than it says about the places I'm in, obviously. Uh, it's got to do with my my frame of mind and my, yeah, the way that I live. But I, when I'm there, I feel more free to do stuff. Mm-hmm. Uh, I've got a car. I always manage to, to do lots of things in one day or I just spend the whole day at the beach watching the waves, like, That's living for me. Are people more relaxed there? <laughs> yeah, it's really interesting. Right. So we were talking about, was it melancholic? No, what, what did I say earlier? Yeah, I think yeah. it was. Um, the Portuguese, Portuguese people are amazing. In general, they come across as melancholic, as negative, as a bit like, oh, life is hard. Mm-hmm. You know, all oh, the other day I saw a really cool video on Instagram where someone's asking what it is to be Portuguese and... The guy saying these things is like, you know, it's hard, life is hard. Or, uh, someone gives you lemons, we build an airplane. Like, it's very <laughs> much that of like, we're, I don't know how to explain. 
but at the same time, they're the most welcoming, most generous people you ever meet. Mm. Feeders who want to feed you everything they have. And the biggest example I have was during lockdown. You know, my partner and I decided to go there and someone lent us a house for five months and someone lent us a car. And then we, after five months, we didn't have a place to stay. Someone else, a distant relative, gave us the keys to another house. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, one time I got my car locked on the beach and I needed to get to Lisbon. And this guy who I'd said hi about once in my life, mm-hmm. I said, oh, my car's locked. Uh, and he was like, take mine. And he just gave me the keys to his car. Wow. Like, you know, they, Portuguese people don't have much money. They probably won't be able to lend you money, but they will feed you and they will give you what they have. Mm-hmm. And I think after experiencing that and experiencing the lifestyle where, my gosh, I can do some self tapes in the morning, go surfing, go have dinner with my family, you know, visit my kids' friends and do an online class. It sounds um, like a dream. I know, I'm sorry. I'm not saying it to, <laughs> to make everybody like, oh, oh bitch, she, she can do this. Because I, I know how, how, I know how lucky I am, but I feel, I feel that now more than ever, people can, can think about doing these things. Mm. You know, so many people have left London and they live in different cities in the UK. And, you know, I know people who left to Barcelona and sometimes they don't commute, but they come here whenever they need to mm. come. Um, I don't know. Oh, COVID also, before I was quite arrogant. Oh no, I just work in the UK, you know, I'm a UK artist. Mm. Yeah. And, pff, that is completely out of the window. I'm happy to work anywhere in the world. I want to see the rest of the world. Yeah. There's so much work, even in musicals. There's a lot of work in Asia. It's a very big market now. Um, Portugal, oh my gosh, yes. I'd love to do more in Portugal. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's been a really good thing to, to, to open up and see, you know, Hollywood is not the end of it. You know, Broadway is not the end of it. West End is not the end of it. Um, there's so much work out there. It's just, you know, we need to keep working in terms of like working on ourselves and our craft. We need to be lucky. We need to be available and, and open for the opportunity to, to arrive. But um, mm. but how do we keep ourselves sane? And I, I Portugal for me has been has been a, a godsend since since lockdown. Nice. So I'm very grateful. You're very welcome to come to Portugal. Yeah. Wow. Um, with, with all my three kids. <laughs> yes, we'll all move you there. Honestly, I would love to have a community there yeah. um, of people. And I think it's doable. I really do. Right. Where's my commission for... Um, <laughs> yeah, Portugal. From Portugal. Ministry uh, of Tourism Ministry of everything. Something. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. So, um, you know, I don't feel like I want to move there permanently. Mm. So I'm very lucky that I still have both places where I can be. And obviously I want to keep working here and mm-hmm. keep having the opportunities I have. Um, but it is funny to see how when we go older with the experience, like your shift changes a little bit and you're like, you know what? I think I'd rather be at the beach with mm-hmm. my friends than being in London, worrying about not having work and yeah. feeling depressed and, you know. Yeah. Sounds yeah. great. One day, one day I'll visit you there for sure. Please. <laughs> it's 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 a real invitation. Yeah, okay. You <laughs> know what? Because I invite everybody, like I was doing this this TV series and my partner was like, okay, how many people have you invited to go to Portugal? I was like, everyone. <laughs> of course. <laughs> and they're real invites. Yeah. And I think people at the beginning are like, oh yeah, yeah, because they think I'm just saying, oh, you should come one. I'm like, no, really. Mm-hmm. Let's have a date. Yeah. As long as my flat is free, you can come. Like <laughs> It's to, to, you know, now when I don't have a proper job, it's tempting, but I, yeah. I need to, you know, figure out my finance life. But then I, I want to, I definitely, like, I, I didn't travel enough in my life. Yeah. I didn't travel enough and I would really want to go. Okay. But, you know, we'll talk about it. We'll later. set a date. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, what is next for you? Anything in the pipeline? Who knows? No. no. <laughs> no. I'm in that, um, I Between mean, jobs, spirit. <laughs> yeah, I mean, okay. So because I have a couple of concerts coming up, mm-hmm. I don't feel like my schedule is completely empty, yeah. which can be daunting. So I have stuff to work towards. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm still feeling a bit high from the last two little jobs that I did. At the same time, I am dying to get work. Yeah, I know it, it's, you know, it's it's our nature, isn't it? 
Like if we haven't worked for months, we want to work. If we just finished work, we want to work. Yeah. Um, and because I do give myself a lot of time, free time, you know, I was in Portugal for three months over Christmas. You know, I feel like I don't need a break. Like um, I can, I can work mm. and like rest in, in between. So um, I don't know what's coming up. Portugal's coming up. I'm going to New York to a friend's wedding. I'm going to Porto to another friend's wedding. Mm. I'm doing a few concerts and hopefully by the end of September, I would have some auditions coming up. Yeah. But well, you can't keep your fingers crossed. Fingers crossed, but also keep my feet on the ground. You know, if things don't happen, just see what I can do and and try and be as proactive as I can. You know? mm. Look, we went through almost everything. I think now we it's time for the blitz round. Are you ready for the blitz round? It's very quick questions, quick answers. Oh no, gosh. no right and wrong answers. Okay. It's not a test. There is no points. Oh my gosh. Ready, yeah? Yeah. Texting or talking? Texting. Cats or dogs? Dogs. All right. Your one guilty pleasure. Oh my God, I don't know. <laughs> Mad Men. That's not a wow. guilty pleasure. That's a really good pleasure. Anyway, carry on. All right. <laughs> <laughs> we mean series, not actual mad man in, no, no, in, the TV series. in yeah. mad his life. <laughs> I've no. got so many guilty pleasures, but they're not coming into my head. Cheese. Okay, carry on. That's okay. Uh, what makes you laugh? What makes me laugh? My partner makes me laugh loads. Mm -hmm. um, what makes me laugh? Me trying to bake. And people thinking that I'm the worst cook and the worst baker in the world. <laughs> All right, but what makes you angry then? Oh, maybe quite a lot of things. Uh, oh, pe if people are rude or unfair, it makes me angry. Mm -hmm. um, what makes me angry? If the fridge door is open, <laughs> is left open. <laughs> or people wasting things like wasting water or... I mean, food is a hard thing, but um, yeah, I can't watch the news. I can't watch the news. Yeah, Makes me angry. I'm there with you. Uh, well, going back to your cooking skills, what dish do you cook best? Uh, I'm a terrible cook. Soups is what I do best. Yeah. Any any favorite soup? <sighs> like all the vegetable soups. Mm -hmm. It's the only thing that I can cook without recipes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I eat a lot of soup, like yeah. I think our lunch is usually soup or whatever. Soups, I'm okay. The rest, I always need recipe books. I don't cook meat or fish. Mm -hmm. I eat meat and fish, but I don't cook it. Mm -hmm. um, it's one rule that we have, so to save the planet and a little bit. And um, so it's all like plant-based stuff. Sometimes it goes okay. Yeah. Um, a lot of the times it doesn't. And, and the baking... Um, I'll send you some videos of results of my baking, okay. so you can laugh. <laughs> uh, your favorite character from any fictional story? Catwoman the... um, and Batman. Yeah. yeah, Catwoman and Batman. Nice. There's no others. Uh, Star Wars or The Lord of the Rings? Star Wars. Do you have any unknown talents, unexpected talents? Can I show you? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Not a talent. Yeah. But it's the only rhythm I can do. There's no other rhythm. This is it. Wow. This is called Casca. <laughs> From no. when I was a hippie in my 20s. Why did we talk about that? <laughs> I did. I used to write songs and sing in Camden. Oh, I, I went to India and I was a hippie for a while. Yeah. Okay. You know what? The, the next podcast, we'll, <laughs> okay. we'll, we'll talk about that. More about that. Yeah. How often do you cry? Oh, a lot. Yeah. I cry a lot because I cry when I'm angry. I cry when I'm sad. I cry when I'm tired. I cry when I feel things aren't fair. <clears throat> um, yeah, I like crying. Mm -hmm. I think it's, um, for me, is very, very relieving. I know people who can't cry, they struggle to cry. Um, I love crying on stage. Although I've decided like, if it comes to me choosing, I'd rather not do very dramatic roles because eight shows a week, it's a lot. But, um, but I, yeah, I love crying. I'm a crier. Okay. Yeah. How can people reach you if they want to work with you? Oh, Instagram. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I've had some people reaching out to me. Like I did a short film recently just because these kids contacted me on Instagram. I was like, okay. Yeah. <laughs> right. And finally, yesterday or a couple of days ago, I asked you to prepare one cool thing, something that you really like and you think our viewers and listeners will like to. <laughs> it's a book. And I'll explain something. So basically, I used to, I was very into this writer when I was young, because you, you learn it at school. He's a Portuguese writer, poet called Fernando Pessoa. And recently I was at an airport and I didn't have a book and I was like, oh, I just want to buy something. And I saw a translated version mm -hmm. of this book I used to read when I was young. I was like, I'm just going to buy this. And I have been obsessed with it. In fact, this is the second one because the one I bought at the airport, I gave it to one of my friends um, to share. I feel like I just want to give this to everybody. Um, so this, this is brand new and it's a different translation. It's a different edition. So it's actually quite different as well. But the, 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 it's called uh, the book of, of disquiet. disquiet. Yeah. The thing about this, which I'm trying to explain is so Fernando Pessoa is a Portuguese poet writer, very short life. I think he died at 40 something and he was born in the 1888. So we're talking about beginning of the 20th century and The incredible thing about this guy is that, you know, those writers who write under different names, they're called uh, pseudonyms. Mm -hmm. So he didn't write under a different name. He wrote under different alter egos that he called heteronyms. Mm -hmm. He made up that word. And basically, he had three main alter egos he wrote under. So all these alter egos had um, a life, a different writing style, yeah. a date of birth, uh, like everything you can imagine they had. And very frequently they commented on each other's work or translated each other's work. <laughs> And the incredible thing is, is that after most of, of um, his work was found after he died. And they found over 150 different alter egos. So this man here, this thing here, was the biggest genius, insane person. Mm -hmm. And this particular book, the Book of Disquiet, there's there's some stuff written under his own name, um, but this book is actually written under the name of Bernard Suage, which is uh, an alter ego. And it's the alter ego that is the closest to him, mm -hmm. to himself. And... Um, And this alter ego lives in Lisbon as a, 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 a desk clerk. Um, and it's all about the melancholy of life, mm -hmm. basically. But it's the most inspirational thing ever. Yeah. And so I wanted to share that. If anyone is interested in Fernando Pessoa, um, you should definitely go to Wikipedia and read about him. And um, and this particular book, I absolutely love. Maybe I should read something from it. Okay, so he says, When I consider with all the clarity I can muster what my life has apparently been, I imagine it as some brightly colored scrap of litter, a chocolate wrapper or a cigar ring that the eavesdropping waitress brushes lightly from the soiled tablecloth into the dustpan amongst the crumbs and crusts of reality itself. Wow. <laughs> so he's, he's, he's great. Yeah. He's uh, honestly, and I've, I've had, and this is, it, the book has been compiled after he died mm -hmm. out of thousands of scrap papers. So every edition is a little different. Um, of the way they put it in order. Mm -hmm. And so it's a book that you can just pick up, open a page and read. You don't have to read mm -hmm. it from beginning to end. And um, yeah, it's considered one of the best works of the 20th century uh, that not many people know of. And um, yeah, it's my new passion wow. at the moment. I love it. I love it. So was it like his actual mental condition that he had split the personalities or he invented them for I don't know on purpose yeah. I don't know I think he I think he had a very um very big inner life yeah. and I I think it could be both hmm. he was an alcoholic as well um he was celibate apparently um so I think there's a lot a lot that it was just I don't know maybe he just wanted to create 
his own competition. Mm -hmm. I don't know. He basically created a generation of writers and it was all him. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm telling you, they're all different, all different styles and themes. And um, it's, it's pretty unbelievable. Mm -hmm. And not many people know of him. There, there's scholars that study just his work and there's still things being found um, from him. So it's, it's uh, yeah, it's an endless pit. Cool, and interesting. It really excites me. There could be like and a even separate in terms video for just like, about that. Even in terms, I spoke with a lot of actors and people who write about him and they're like, oh my gosh, I'm, I'm writing something related to that or I'm writing. So uh, I, I do feel like I'm hoping that new generations and international generations would, will, will, will discover him mm -hmm. because um, he is a world. Yeah. He's a world in itself. And um, yeah. And I grew up hearing about him. Obviously in Portugal is one of our greatest. And, and now it's back. Nice. In my life. Thank you so much. It was yeah. wonderful. I hope we will do it again at some point. Will yes. we maybe when your thing comes out and we can talk about it properly. Yeah. Maybe we will have something more. I really hope I'll be back to class when I can. Yeah. And I really hope I'll have a chance to talk to you and to uh, work with you and visit you in Portugal. Yes! <laughs> It's all there. It's all happening. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, if you enjoyed the video, please like, please subscribe, or as I say in every video, or don't. It's up to you. <laughs> Thank you. Bye, guys.